Uh, I just want to say, because we have a packed uh, program tonight, so to speak, and we're also uh, finishing tonight's proceedings with uh, yet another event, a launch, a very celebratory launch, um, I think I'd better get on the way. So my name is Mark Ledbury, and I am a <laughs> Professor of Art History and Director of the Power Institute here at the University of Sydney. And I'm delighted to be here at the Chow Chat Wing, and I want to thank David Ellis, Paul Donnelly, Craig Barker, and all the crew at the Chow Chap Wing, because this is an event organised jointly by Power and the uh, Chow Chap Wing's Public Programs um, branch. And um, before I get any further, I'd like to acknowledge that, of course, uh, we're here on Gadigal land, and acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which this and many other of the university's lands stand, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, acknowledging tens of thousands of years of indigenous teaching, learning, and transmission of culture, I pay my deep respects to elders past, present, and future. And because tonight's panel is both distinguished and packed, my job is essentially to keep time, uh, introduce our panel, and say a, a few brief words before handing over. And um, I might just uh, arrest this PowerPoint here, just so we're not all uh, too distracted by the, uh, the rolling uh, uh, scale there. But I want to just acknowledge that this panel emerges uh, as one of a series inspired by the exhibition Light in Darkness, uh, of which this is the wonderful book uh, that we celebrate later tonight, curated uh, by Anne Stephen and Katrina Liberio and it's currently on So Upstairs. If you haven't seen it, you must go and see it. It's a fantastic show. We're following the very stimulating discussion of conceptual art in its shadow a few weeks back, and next month we're returning for another discussion uh, uh, inspired by the show on art and perception, uh, perception indeed across science, psychology, and art, and that's on September the 15th. Tonight's panel is entitled Psychedelic Promises, and um, our panel really are here to think about how LSD and other psychedelics impacted science, culture, and medicine in the 1960s, but especially perhaps what's driving the revival of interest in psychedelics, in health, in science, and indeed in popular and general culture today. And we have a distinguished panel of guests, and I'm going to introduce them briefly and all together, and then I'm going to let them get on with it. Um, so, I'm delighted to be able to welcome them first, um, and I'm going to go from nearer me to the furthest away. Um, Rob, uh, Dr. Robert Gordon, a consultant psychiatrist in private practice, uh, who was the Australian representative to the International Association of Psychotherapy, and um, while um, a senior consultant psychiatrist at Westmead, was the director here at the University of Sydney of the Master in Medicine and Psychotherapy Training Programme. But he's especially important to us tonight because he conducted psychotherapy with the use of LSD uh, in the 60s, and will tell us more about that. So, Emeritus Professor Andrew McNamara is an art historian whose focus is, is, is on modern and contemporary art uh, uh, across the whole of the 20th and early 21st uh, century, and his latest book is Surpassing Modernity, Ambivalence in Art, Politics, and Society, which came out in 2018. Uh, Dr. Dilara Vacelici um, is a neuroscientist who specializes in the therapeutic potential of psycho uh, psychoactive drugs like cannabis and psychedelics. Dilara is working currently as a research fellow in the George Institute to facilitate clinical trials with psychedelics for psychiatric conditions and as a science communicator for Silo, an Australian biotech company that's developing a uh, of uh, uh, working on next generation psychedelic inspired medicines. Uh, Josh Berger is a researcher with special interest in mental health and medicine, and he completed his PhD studying synesthesia here, and is currently completing the final year of his medical doctorate at the University of Sydney. Josh was the brains, if some of you remember this, behind the uh, Power's uh, re uh, fairly recent Taste of Purple event around synesthesia, and it's absolutely delight to have him uh, back with us. And uh, lastly, Dr. Vince Polito is Senior Research Fellow in the School of Psychological Sciences, a member of the Biomolecular Discovery Research Centre at Macquarie University, and his research focuses on developing measures of how our sense of self changes in different contexts, clinical conditions, and altered states of consciousness. 
So I hope you'll agree, it's a distinguished panel, I'd like you to welcome you all. Um, we will start off following my own technical uh, uh, inadequacy with um, Bob, uh, who wanted us to particularly to uh, start with a citation. And uh, may I hand over to uh, you, Bob, to yes. take us away? I was not rather than talk about LSD, which everyone else did, with a lot of my head something one way. I'll give you my experience. We decided that if we were going to give it to anyone, we'd better have it first. And so one of my dearest colleagues sat with me while I had a dose of LSD. Uh, it was in the evening, I was lying on my bed. I was always allergic to strawberry ice cream. I never knew why, but if I looked at it, I felt disgusted. And suddenly, as this LSD began to work. I was four years old. Four years old, I wasn't any longer me. My father, who had been a barrister in Hungary where I was born, had a favorite aunt who was a very famous operetta singer in Vienna, and she had a chalet off Salzburg on the lakes. At least a time, when I was four, we went to visit her. The delightful woman who used to take me out on a motorboat on the lake when the moon was out and sing the arias, which is quite beautiful. We came back to the Salzburg station. My father bought me an ice cream cone, a vanilla ice cream cone. But in my haste to get off the train and get it onto the platform, I spilled the vanilla ice cream on the platform. None of this did I remember previously until the LSD started to work. He sat me on two suitcases and not far away was a coffee shop and my mother and he went and had a cup of coffee as I guarded, my four-year-old guarded these two, two uh, suitcases with his blob of ice cream 15 feet away from me. About five minutes passed and this is all under LSD, I have no memory of this. I saw an old man running along the platform followed by two brown shirts. They were Nazis. He was running as fast as he could, the Nazis were after him. He slipped on my ice cream and hit his head. And as he went down into the way, the ice cream tripped, the blood trickled into the ice cream. And that was strawberry ice cream. And until that moment, I had no knowledge of why I felt the way I did. And since that moment, I've had no problem being a story. <laughs> now, there is an example of unconscious processes working powerfully without you knowing why. And most of the LSD, which was running groups that I ran, had similar experiences along the way. Uh, the process was because David Madison, who was then professor of psychiatry, and supervised me by love in my final year of my psychiatric qualification. And he had a very good friend called John R., who you may or may not know. He was the most senior psychiatrist in Sydney with a large practice. And he suggested to John that I should become a partner of theirs before I graduated, which I thought was quite an honor. And he gave me free reign as I had used LSD a little bit at Broughton Hall. Any of you can remember Broughton Hall? It was the outpatient department of Callum Park and was commonly uh, a venue at which you got to meet people who had severe personality problems or neurotic problems but weren't, se weren't severe enough to be hospitalized. There was a young psychiatrist they called Kent, we always called him Clark Kent, but it wasn't Clark. He was a superman, although we thought he was at the time. He was running a group of LSD patients, rather young ones, never let us in on the, on the actual meetings, but would talk about the enormous changes that occurred in these people in a relatively short six-month period of time. 
So when I spoke to David Madison and John about trying a trial of LSD on patients, they both agreed and we agreed that we'd do a 30 patient trial. Uh, we chose very carefully, and his book, Barling and Buckman, who were the British using it at the time, printed in 64 when I first got it. And the amazing range of things that they were treating, six sessions and over. Psoriasis was one, six sessions. Anxiety, depression, personality disorder, in a very rapid range uh, of treatments, cure. I decided to choose the first five. We were going groups of five. We had five sessions of group therapy so that everyone got to know everyone else very well. And then they would go to a private hospital. The nurse would also be part of the group, would also be part of the setting in the hospital in a large lounge room. Uh, they all got five, and uh, they all got 75 micrograms of LSD into muscularly, works in 15 minutes. And then it was up to them to decide what they wanted to do, and they would either lie there or chat to one another or share some experience that came up. Uh, five of those we terminated with Thigak at the time. At lunch, by the time two o'clock came, everything had worn off. We had an arrangement that at six o'clock each night I would ring them to ask how they were. Never had any trouble. They had five sessions of LSD and then five group therapy sessions subsequently. We got to 15 and Sandos withdrew the LSD because the government forbade it. So we got 15 down the track. None of the 15 came back. They all got better. Anxiety, depression, chronic phobia, obsessive compulsive neurosis, depression, uh, and that was it. We carefully excluded psychosis, bipolar disorder. Uh, they are not within the realm of LSD. Of those 15 we treated before they were doing the LSD, none of them came back. All of them resolved their problem five LSD sessions, five and five groups of group therapy. I don't like anyone to match that when they do more than personal therapy. And I'm a specialist in personal therapy. It was a disastrous experience to find that halfway through our research study. Sam Dost, well, it was Nixon because those who were having LSD wouldn't go to war. And he had a Vietnam War in his hand, so he took out a law to prevent the use of psychedelics and drifted across to Australia and then prevented our use. There's a move of foot to try to bring some of this back at the moment. Some of us will talk about it. It's a complicated uh, process, and if any of you saw four corners, you will have seen some of the pitfalls of, of people who haven't had enough experience or training. Um, I don't really want to talk very much more about it at this stage because the others need some time too. But you can hear my personal experience. The others have similar experiences. Uh, and the process was amazingly mind-changing. Uh, and so I would like to see it come back. Uh, there is a group of 120 psychiatrists now who are working towards that, quite separate from my mentor. Uh, some of them are already doing some training in Melbourne. Uh, some of Simon is being used for depression, I think it's for some medicines. And NDMA is proving very successful in post traumatic stress disorder. But the, the soldiers suffer from them, die, kill themselves. My experience was post traumatic stress disorder, but I wasn't aware of that, or the title was aware of But I can eat strawberry ice cream. Thank you. Thank you.
you know, the show upstairs um, will, you know, um, set off the, an understanding that experimentation of various kinds was rife at a moment uh, of, you know, let's call it the second half of the 60s. And I, I want to hand over to um, Andrew now to say a little about, kind of, if you like, we've had a fantastic insight into uh, a certain hope in psychiatry and psychology book. Uh, talk to us a little, Andrew, about the, the more general cultural um, uh, embrace of LSD, if you like, and uh, among other things. <laughs> it's very hard act to follow because, um, really, I was just saying, there's certain discussions that come up all the time in this area. One of them is uh, your, you know, experiential reflections. Uh, the other thing is, I noticed the discussions quickly go from medical reasons to whole discussion. We'll, Wild discussions about consciousness, the nature of consciousness. So it seems to be one of these fields that does lend itself to broader discussions. But in the arts, it's a little bit more uh, complicated because as art historians, we're always looking for interesting ways to perceive art, but also worry about using one lens that then becomes determines how you look at that art. So um, I know a lot of us in this. Uh, like 60s, early 70s, did talk about their use, and there's been famous examples. Mark was talking earlier about laudanum absence in the, like, uh, in the um, up with poets like Verlaine, Rambo, etc. It was a clearly um, talked about amount of discussion. So it has happened a lot, and it's that carries the same sort of patterns. Um, talk about imaginative possibilities, followed by crackdowns about it because of potential things going out of control. So for me, the complication is that um, you can go up to the show, and I, I was asked by um, curators to write a few essays. And that's the only reason I'm here, actually, just because I wrote a few essays on the works. Now when we talk about psychedelics, I can go upstairs and look at them and think, oh my god, I should have written something different, because I see them in different ways now. So even the ones that look least LSD or trippy or psychedelic. So there's that aspect that you can bring um, fascinating aspects to a discussion of art, but the trap is that a lot of artists are reticent about talking about these things or any determinate explanation for their art because other, particularly in psychedelics, it could be seen as just too easy or a bit of a fake or, you know, implies that the art is um, somehow less genuine perhaps. So there is that reticence about it. I also think it's a bit tricky for the arts because the arts are trapped in the same period, like the six, late 60s and early 70s. If you did a show, uh, psychedelic art, it would have to look like it came from the cover of Yellow Submarine, right? And no one else would recognise it as such. But um, so uh, as a thought experiment, it'd be interesting to do, can you do a show that was about psychedelia in art that didn't look psychedelic at first place, but it was an interesting framework for then looking at the art in a different way. And I think that's an interesting thing about the limits of this and also the potentials of it as well. Um, and I just want to use uh, one quote about art that comes from, just to turn that around a little bit, to. Um, explore the connections then between psycho and, uh, psychedelic experience and the arts. It's from a philosopher called Liz Gross, who many people know taught here uh, many years ago. And so in, in a discussion of art, and she says, paint has within it not just colour qualities, but also emotional qualities. Materiality can make joy. So art is a distraction from this materiality of a sensation whose potential in that materiality has never been seen, heard, or felt as such before. The virtual expression is a possibility of a future expression that isn't contained in the present expression. Art is political, then she goes on to say, because it contains with it this future which isn't worked out, which is pure potentiality, and which a new people, a people yet to come, can live. What I was thinking about from that definition is that um, 
when I hear these current discussions about psychedelia, I wonder if this definition of art sort of tells you that art is doing something that psychedelia promises in the experience, but doing it already. So I'll just leave that as a provocation. We can come back to that. <laughs> See. So I just want to talk about both the pitfalls and the affinities between these two types of discussion and leave the um, ambiguity for the three scientists to figure out. But before we leave the 60s, though, and I mean, I always reflect that we have in the exhibition, you know, the great Clement, Green, Clement Greenberg arrives here in Australia to tell us about Adam Garland Kitsch, a, a category into which he probably might have cast the very art that at the very same moment was being exported. But if you think about Martin Sharp and Richard Neville in London in the same period, and the, you know, the countercultural valence of a certain kind of art, some of which uh, was flashing before you as we started. It does strike me that, in a way, uh, I agree entirely about this idea of the kind of utopian potential of some of the stuff that you've been seeing up there. But there, there's been a certain snobbery about, uh, about psychedelia. I mean, we, don't, we still don't have a, a thoroughly serious account of Martin Sharp in the, in the, in the, in the Australian uh, canon. And we also, I think, I mean, I don't know, what, do you think that uh, things like Adrian Piper, uh, who was a famous LSD user, and uh, Sigma Polka, and others of that ilk, and have we fully recuperated that part of 60s uh, into, into, you know, a kind of currency, or are we still regarded as sort of the things that, like, that LSD made in the arts as being slightly weird or odd or, uh, or a dead end? Yeah, I don't know what you think about that. Well, the Yellow House has been recuperated yeah. a few times, so there's been exhibitions about that. Um, Polka is a fascinating character, you might not know him, but he used a lot of, uh, there's two real famous artists, in the, uh, German artists of that period, Sigma Polka and Gerhard Richter. And Richter said, the difference between me and Polka was Polka took a lot more drugs. <laughs> so, um, and he also believed in UFOs and tried to put it all together in um, the art. You could sort of see it. So it's, it's, there are parts of it that have been recuperated. I know what you mean about the stop reel, but um, yeah, I'll, I'll, it, it, it's, it's very difficult because if you sort of say, okay, this is a hippie trippy art, what's this other one? And sometimes people could do LSD, but the art doesn't look like it. So that's exactly. a, a poor, tricky thing for me. The Beatles one is very interesting because you can see that, that you know, they're on amphetamines in Hamburg and then all the early stuff's rock and, you know, <laughs> busy rock and roll. And then they get into marijuana, everything gets a bit more landward, and then suddenly Tomorrow Never Knows comes out of nowhere and you realise they're on LSD. So it's sort of obvious, but it doesn't explain every song either. But, and it's, beyond that point, it's hard to, to do it that way. For the so, it, yeah, that's why I think it'd be interesting to do an LSD show. Uh, sorry, a psychedelia show. Now. Uh, I don't want to take preferences, you guys. Um, <laughs> Uh, to do it now and to do works like Adrian Piper or something that just doesn't look LSD or 60s-ish at all. That would be interesting, I think. Thank that you. I was going to do a show, that's what I'm doing. And I'm sure there'll be people with questions on this topic. And um, uh, we're going to pass over to really think about the, you know, what's going on now and why things have been revived. But I think, um, Bob, you were very moving about just what happened and the speed and the rapidity with which the, um, the psychiatric and medical communities were shut down. Um, and we have to remember the, uh, I think I put a few of the most scary stories, I know some of you saw on the PowerPoint, you know, the, the idea that the, Australian, the American Navy was going to go into a, you know, a complete crash because everyone's going to take LSD and see flowers and crash the ships. But the, that's only a slightly looted view of what really was a full-on moral panic about uh, the, the possible effects of LSD. And Nixon's decree has had a massive shadow. I don't know if you really want to talk about that a little bit before talking about now, or what the effect has been of that shutdown uh, before going on to talk about how we're sort of trying to get out of the shadow. I can, I can just say something quickly about that. 
just to just maybe give a little bit of context from the science point of view of that shutdown, at the time that uh, the drug control laws were passed and the, these substances that became prohibited, there was a lot of research going on. I mean, the, the prohibitions came because the, these drugs, LSD in particular, was um, you know, leaking out onto the streets and was becoming quite a countercultural thing. But that wasn't the only thing that was going on. There were, there were thousands of psychiatrists and doctors and researchers that were doing work with uh, these substances. The sort of work they were doing probably wouldn't stand up to the kind of um, levels of scientific rigor, rigor that we do today, but they were, for the time, very good studies researching to a range of addiction treatments, uh, treatments for mood disorders, um, treatments for things like autism. And when the sort of change happened, there was quite a lot of uproar among the scientific community. There was definitely pushback and people that tried to argue against that happening, but they, they weren't successful and it really was, you know, it was really put psychology and psychiatry research back 40 years that, that shut down. And I think we'll see now we'll talk a little bit more about where things are at now, I think, in the next few contributions. Yeah, and that's really where we want to go now. And, uh, um, so yeah, I guess we're in this age now where there has been a massive resurgence of psychedelic research. Um, and I think it has a lot of merit that even though you know the American government tried to shut it down with full force, full force, it has reemerged. And I think a lot of that is because the research itself that's emerging is really promising. Um, and there's a few factors. It's also because um, we're living through a mental health crisis at the moment and a drug addiction crisis. Um, and there's been changing attitudes with medical cannabis being legalized as well. And this has kind of set up the environment to facilitate people accepting psychedelic psychiatry. Um, for me personally, I got into psychedelic psychiatry because last year I lost a friend to suicide and I lost a friend to drug addiction. And they were my age. I thought that's just not good enough. Um, and a lot of my friends were struggling with mental health at the time. And as I started to look around and started to look at the research, you know, psychedelics were emerging as this really promising treatment. Um, and I need to tell you all that there is no uh, registered approved psychedelic medicine apart from ketamine-based treatments um, for any mental health disorder at the moment. They are controlled substances. They can only be legally accessed through clinical trials. But the research is really, really promising at the moment. Um, we're talking about, yes, classic psychedelics in this sense, but I do want to bring up MDMA as well. That falls under that umbrella because it's the most advanced. It's in uh, phase three trials, which is the last phase of trials to prove a drug is efficacious for post-traumatic stress disorder, and it's likely to be approved um, probably mid-23. Um, and it's just shown a lot of promise in the sense that people, ah, yeah, I should say that with these trials, it's not just the drug itself, um, the drug is being given two or three times in a course of psychotherapy and being used as a tool to catalyze the benefits of psychotherapy. Um, and with MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD, about 80% of, no, sorry, 60% of participants are losing their PTSD diagnosis. And that sort of hasn't been seen before. And the other psychedelic um, that's been given breakthrough therapy status by the FDA, which is the Food and Drug Administration that regulates drug use, uh, in America, and they, based on how promising a treatment is and how needed it is, um, they can fast track uh, the approval of a drug. And so, psilocybin for uh, depression is the other drug that's showing a lot of promise. That's in phase two trials, um, but similar results in the sense that so, when people take psilocybin assisted psychotherapy, uh, about 70 to 80 percent of people are responding to the treatment, you know, they're getting the drug one or two times. Uh, and the effects are rapid in about a week, and they can be enduring at six to 12 months. And this is just profound. So with normal antidepressants, in the trials, about 30 to 50% of people respond to the treatment, and it can take about four weeks to show effect. Uh, and in that time, like, the psychiatrist or the, you know, the GP can tell you that it can get worse before it gets better. Um, and they can have adverse effects as well that can be worse than the, you know, the depression that it's trying to treat. Um, so psilocybin is showing a lot of promise in this space, um, but these trials are limited in the sense that they're being done in small numbers of people and highly selected populations. So I think in one of the studies, about 90% of the participants were excluded. So there's a lot more work to be done in this area of expanding the um, indication, sorry, the patient population to see what the real-world utility is. 
Um, but I might pass on to Josh to speak on that matter. Thank you, Lara. Thank you, Mark. Uh, and also thank you to Andrew and Bob for your anecdotes and uh, personal experiences. They were really powerful. Um, hi, everyone. And uh, as you've heard, my name is Josh Berger. And I'm going to briefly talk about what I see as the challenges uh, facing the integration of psychedelic therapy into mainstream medicine. I apologise. I am going to read a bit from my notes. And this is just mainly to contain myself. And when we go into the, um, into the more panel discussion, I'll be a bit more freeform. So to give you some background to myself, I'll be working as a junior doctor next year, and I have a strong interest in the brain and mind. I spent five years away from medical school, completing a PhD studying synesthesia, a condition that's often um, described as a crossing of senses. For example, some of you might be familiar with musicians who, when they hear music, not only hear the music, they see the music um, in response to the auditory stimulation. And this is just one type of synesthesia. As you may also know, a transient experience of synesthesia is often the hallmark of, the psych of a psychedelic substance. Now, on a return to medical school, I happened to catch wind of uh, the so-called psychedelic renaissance. Now, what really grabbed my attention and made it seem real was the fact that regulatory bodies, as Delara has just spoken about, like the FDA and even our own TGA, have been actively considering how to reschedule several psychedelic substances, in particular MDMA and psilocybin, which for those of you uh, who are not sure about what psilocybin is, it's the active, uh, it's the pro-drug uh, active ingredient of so-called magic mushrooms. Um, and this has all been on the backdrop of this promising research data. So at this time, however, it seemed to me that there's this real disconnect between, on the one hand, this incredible momentum which is gathering advocacy and research, and the fact that these regulatory bodies are changing their scheduling, and on the other, any integration, any practical integration into mainstream medicine. Now, during my training as a medical student, not a peep has been given, uh, not a peep has been said about psychedelic therapies, perhaps understandably, um, and moreover, if psychedelic substances are mentioned in any sort of clinical setting, um, the taboo in social reticence is still quite palpable. We just don't talk about it, and it's hard to talk about openly for obvious reasons. So how can this gap between the increasing momentum of research and advocacy and regulations um, of psychedelic therapies and psychedelic substances uh, and the integration into mainstream medicine be reached? It's a big topic, so that's why I'm trying to cut myself down. In my simplified way of thinking about this question, I see three main challenges. First is the legislative challenge. I won't say too much on this problem other than the following because it really is quite self-explanatory. Psychedelic therapy cannot become a part of mainstream medicine while there's no legal prescription access um, and supply pathways. Even if and when these judicial barriers are overcome, there's going to be a lag in the commercial production, the provision of affordable indemnity and insurance to practitioners delivering these psychedelic therapies, and therefore a delay in the affordable delivery of these therapies to the patients who need them most. Um, and as you've heard, they can have some really dramatic effects. The second challenge is the development of a reliable evidence base that shows a psychedelic therapy for the given medical indication is being, which is being prescribed is safe is a safe and effective choice. Uh, these, there are some really serious difficulties in overcoming this challenge that relate to horrible scientific words, like sample heterogeneity, protocol standardization, double blinding randomization, the observer effect, just to name a few. Um, I'm sure internally both Fitz and Delara are noting concerns. However, this second challenge is less of a barrier than we may have once thought, just because of the problems and trials that we've already seen, seen and the fact that the FDA and the TGA are moving on these things. Also consider the fact that we know these substances show vastly favourable safety profiles, that is in terms of their physiological effects, compared to many of the medications that we, the doctors prescribe on a daily basis. Consider opioids, benzodiazepines, which are known potent respiratory depressants. Um, perhaps of more relevance in terms of safety is the short-term use of psychedelic substances in conjunction with courses of psychotherapy may avert the heavy side effect burden and economic costs which often, or I'm not going to say always, but often accompany the long-term use of any psychiatric medications. Um, in the initial, I guess, indication period for taking SR SSRIs and SNRIs, one of the things junior doctors are told to look out for is suicidality because they increase the risk of suicide. Now, though I'm, being, though I'm being quite optimistic about the growing evidence base becoming sufficient to allow the integration of psychedelic uh, therapies into mainstream medicine, I do also acknowledge that it is still relatively early days. And like in the case of any new therapy, 
The initial benefits are likely to be oversold and the risks are likely to be underplayed. Now, professional bodies like the Royal Australian New Zealand College of Psychiatrists, or RANCP for short, are taking similarly cautious yet hopeful stances on the potential integration of these therapies. For example, in the summary of their official memorandum on this subject, which was updated just this July, they say there is limited but emerging evidence that psychedelic therapies may have therapeutic benefits in the treatment of a range of mental illnesses. And, and importantly, further research is required to assess their efficacy, safety and effectiveness of psychedelic therapies to inform future potential use in psychiatric practice. Now, the last of the three uh, challenges is what I think is perhaps most important. Obviously, the legal ones have to be overcome. So, this challenge I see is the development of clear protocols for the treatment that emphasise the crucial role of multidisciplinary teams. This year, at the RAND CP Congress, the opening plenary lecture was given by the American psychiatrist, Professor Alan Francis, who has chaired the task force overseeing the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or DSM, as you may know it. Now, as a side note, Professor Carhart Harris, who's kind of one of the leading figures of the psychedelic renaissance, he also spoke at this con conference, but I digress. Now, Professor Francis's talk was titled In Praise of the Biopsychosocial Model. <laughs> and as a student, this was really heartening to hear. His first slide had the following text written on it. The biopsychosocial model is an interdisciplinary approach that integrates biology, psychology, and social environmental factors in understanding and treating psychiatric disorders. Without doing him proper justice, I'll try to summarize the main points of his talk. Dr. Allen highlighted the importance of holistic care in mental health, underpinning how psychiatry has benefited less than most other medical specialties from the booming redu reduction of science, which has happened in the last century. I mean, just consider anesthesiology or surgery or anything like that. They've really come a long way. However, he equally emphasised that fads emphasising singular factors of mental health, such as psychoanalysis or sociocultural factors, have each only ever managed, at most, to inch the field of mental health forwards. He quipped something like this. In psychiatry, I equally distrust biological reductionism because it is mindless, psychological reductionism because it is brainless, and social reductionism because it blames everything else on external trauma. Now, the reason I raised Dr. Francis's talk in relationship to this third channel, that is, uh, this third challenge, that is developing clear protocols for the treatment that emphasise the crucial role of multidisciplinary teams, is that no other therapeutic modality that I know of so heavily affects each part of the biopsychosocial model. Psychedelics clearly have potent and diverse biological effects, the serotonergic agonists and neurotrophs. Uh, that they are powerfully psychoactive is the obvious property that sparks initial interest. And as I hope everyone here will appreciate, the long history of their use in indigenous cultures and the more modern and divisive history shows that psychedelic substances can have powerful effects on the social environment. This is why I believe the third and final challenge of ensuring the integration of psychedelic, uh, psychedelic therapies in the mainstream of medicine comes with the emphasis of multidisciplinary care, which is led by, yet extends beyond, medical doctors. This is so important to overcome. Now, there are many other problems I could discuss, like the need for standardised and objective language and clinician education, but I would just bore you. So I'm gonna stop here and see if anyone else would like to comment on some of the things which they think are most challenging in kind of bringing psychedelic therapy into the mainstream. Does anyone want to comment on that before we pass it to um, one thing I've heard recently is that um, someone doubted the take of this because Big Pharma won't be interested in that you have to choose psilocybin and then that's it. Well, most medication you have to take it daily or something, but well, why would they invest in something where you just take it once or twice and then that's it, the rest of the year you're good. So that is a little bit of a problem in the sense that, um, yeah, so drug development is really expensive. If you're starting from scratch all the way through to development, it costs about 300 to $3 billion per drug. So drug companies want drugs that can make profit for them to um, recoup on those costs. So psilocybin is a natural compound, so it can't be patented, and MDMA has existed for a long time, and for the same reason, it can't be patented. Um, so there's just no commercial interest in 
um, drug companies pursuing these drugs. So it's academics and non-profits um, that are pushing these drugs through. So these drugs have existed for a long time and we have a lot of benefit in knowing their safety and there's like, you know, the research was being done in the 50s. So from this point forward, it still costs tens of millions of dollars, which is better, but there is the issue that it's kind of hard to find someone to fund that research because not only do you need to conduct these large studies to show that it's effective, the studies that are needed to get a drug um, registered and then uh, are reimbursed are different and that's additional. So there is still a lot more work done. Like a drug can be an effective drug, but then there is extra work to get that drug accessible. Um, but in saying that there are about 100 companies pursuing uh, psychedelic analogs, so novel psychedelics that haven't existed before, and there's probably you know, hundreds of thousands of new psychedelics being developed that will be profitable. Yeah. yeah. But tonight, just before that, I would like to make sure it's just a scoop. But I mean, you raised the point of the money that we have watched in the last two years a lot of concerted government and drug industry action when it was required or when it was felt that there was a, a reason for that to happen. When it was, I mean, we, the COVID experiment has shown it's funny, but you can accelerate drug uh, trials and you can. Uh, make a deal with the pharma companies to produce. So is, is, is the question that we need to tell people the extent of the problem which these therapies can address? In other words, convince governments and others of the, of the crushing weight of, the, um, you know, of mental health issues for all societies? Or is it that you know, they will never be, you know, unless it's as obvious as a pandemic, we're never going to see such rushed action again? I mean, is there any way, I suppose I'm asking you, ex accelerating these processes in a, an appropriate and safe, but nevertheless faster way? I think so, and we're seeing that um, our government alone is, it was actually the first government to contribute funding to psychedelic studies. Last year, there was $15 million contributed in this area, and there's a lot more uh, money going into mental health research. And... One of the silver lining things of COVID was to show that we can do things differently and better, and that is coming through, and we're hoping to apply that to mental health research, and that's part of the research I do at the George Institute, is conducting clinical trials that are more effective and more efficient, that they're faster and cheaper, and doing it in a way that's mimicking what was done with COVID to uh, just get, get to the answer a lot faster and cheaper. So there is a lot of hope coming through. Awesome. Sure. Okay, hi. Um, I want to try and say a little bit about, uh, I guess, the, the cultural story around psychedelics at the moment and where we're at. So we heard a little bit before that at the time that these drugs were banned in the 1970s, psychedelics were very important. They were certainly a uh, big part of culture and counterculture, and they were also becoming a very important part of, of medicine and psychiatry. And that scientific research, like I said before, all got shut down, but Psychedelics didn't go away. It was certainly people still using psychedelics through the 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, but they certainly became much more taboo. It wasn't something that was like a popular mainstream topic. And, you know, at that time, there was influence of psychedelics on music. There was still underground psychedelic science. As a, you know, I'm not in any way trained art historian or, or art theorist, but from my point of view, it certainly seems like psychedelics had a big impact on art, and you disagree, Mark, but there, there was this kind of uh, cultural wave that, that rippled out from that big moment in the 60s and has continued in many ways. But right now, we're at a really interesting time and a really interesting situation where this attitude around psychedelics seems to have changed or be changing dramatically. It doesn't at all feel anymore like psychedelics are to the topic, there's a lot of interest in psychedelics, there's a lot of um, references in popular culture, documentaries, movies, it's something that lots of people know about and are interested about and, and want to talk about, which is you know, great as someone working in psychedelic science, but it's interesting to think about why this shift has happened, and I think there's, there's really two reasons. The first and most obvious reason is that there has been this resurgence of research over the last 20 years, and especially the last 10 years, that has been really impressive and is, as um, you know, it is quite hard to ignore. And news of that, I think, is kind of seeping out into culture and is having a big effect. But at the same time, I think another reason that there is a, a shift in attitudes is that there's now new forms of psychedelics, or at least the idea that there's new forms of psychedelics. And 
what I mean by that is that now that because of this increase in popularity in psychedelics, it doesn't seem, I think, to many people like something that you have to go and do at a rave or with hippies or even overseas at a retreat center in the jungle or something like that. Now, it seems like the cultural story around psychedelics is much more that you can go to a very luxurious and fancy retreat center, maybe not very far from your home. Um, and also, there's um, when I say other forms, there's also potential for other forms of dosing as well. I've done a lot of research on microdosing, and this is a phenomenon that's become extremely popular over the last five or six years. And the idea with microdosing is that people take very, very low doses of psychedelics, but regularly, maybe a couple of times a week. Um, doses so low that you don't have these extreme profound alterations of consciousness, but many people believe still lead to, to a range of benefits. And so I think that shift has been quite has had quite an important impact because suddenly now psychedelics aren't this scary thing. They are something that can be much more kind of brought into most people's everyday lives. And I think that there's kind of good and bad things about that. Like I said, this creates a lot of opportunities for research, but it also does lead to uh, you know, some risks and dangers, some of those risks and dangers are that it can lead to people having, you know, maybe unwarranted expectations about how magically and wonderfully and quickly psychedelics can work for all sorts of different conditions. Uh, it can also lead to a lot of pressure to provide these treatments right now because, you know, there's, there's all of these stories that we hear about how great they are. And certainly there, there are encouraging stories about psychedelics, but as Delara said, I think probably it was Josh, in, in most of these studies, many, many people are excluded, and so the results that we get is a very homogenized and, and sort of re reductionist view of how these might actually work at scale. And so I think there's, there's a real risk there around um, providing these, these uh, treatments before we have the infrastructure to allow them to be done safely. Um, and it does seem like the, these changes are coming. It does seem like psychedelic medicines are absolutely on the way. And it's, interesting, I think, to, to sort of wonder about how that is going to play out culturally as well. Um, and what I mean there is that our, our culture hasn't really had much in the way of sanctioned altered states of consciousness. And we're very different to most cultures historically because of that. And I, anthropology tells us something like, I think it's 78 percent of cultures have profound altered states as part of their normal societal cultural practice. We haven't really had that. People have used psychedelics, but it hasn't been mainstream. Now as psychedelics become part of medicine, I think it's really interesting to think about how that's going to affect our society and culture, to, to have people having these experiences. In, in most situations where people have taken psychedelics in the past, there's been really strong associations of religious or spiritual content. It's usually done as part of a religious ritual or it's part of some cosmology. It's going to be very different in medicine. It's going to be done in a very humanistic way. There's not going to be these religious kind of uh, associations. But people are still going to have really profound experiences and it's, it's not clear exactly how that's going to play out. I mean, there's, there's evidence showing that psychedelics can change personality, it can be, make people more open-minded, more socially connected, and that sounds great. But there's, there's also evidence that it can change people's metaphys metaphysical beliefs and attitudes. It can make people um, more fixated on beliefs they've already had. It might make them more likely to uh, engage with fantastical ideas. It could make people less um, uh, could make people uh, less critical in their thinking and decision making. And so it's something that a lot of researchers have paying attention to at the moment are the potential epistemic risks of psychedelics. And uh, I think that's a really important area that we need to sort of understand how we can provide these therapies in ways that are going to support people without projecting any beliefs onto patients that maybe aren't going to serve them. So it's, it's a very complicated area. There's this whole range of different risks. Um, I guess I just wanted to kind of finish by saying a little bit about at how this might play out in Australia and around the world more directly. Like Delara said, most of the research that's been going on so far has been very much sort of along the strand of drug development, standard drug development, and that is a very long and expensive process, but it's bearing fruit. It does seem like MDMA for PTSD is going to be a prescribable medicine in the States within the next year or so, and um, so for depression will, will follow soon after. Once that happens in the States, it's pretty likely that Australia will, will follow suit relatively quickly. So it, there is this kind of drug development pathway that's being pursued. The big complication uh, 
again, just to, to riff off one of the previous ideas, is that unlike any other medicine that's come before, this isn't just a drug. This is a drug with psychotherapy, and you don't really have ways of regulating psychotherapy in that way. And so there's real questions around training and access and how well that's going to play out. Um, but, it, but it is happening. Um, the, the other sort of potential way that uh, there may be access to psychedelics that's probably less relevant to Australia, but is happening in other places around the world, uh, decriminali decriminalization movements. So in some places, psychedelics are already decriminalized. Um, psychedelic truffles in the Netherlands, uh, all drugs in Portugal, um, and in some jurisdictions in the United States, such as Oregon, there's now decriminalization efforts that are, that are well underway. And so in these kinds of uh, places, um, people can access these substances in a kind of grey legal area. And so, um, yeah, I, mean, I, I guess I just kind of wanted to finish on that by just saying that, that this is something that's happening, um, and there's lots of potential benefits of that, and it's really exciting. But there, there are some risks as well. We, we need to be careful and, and really think about how we can have these be a part of medicine in a way that are really going to help without causing additional risks. Wonderful. I, um, first of all, thank you to everyone for keeping so marvellously to time, which means <laughs> that we have time for lots of Q&A because you've thrust a lot of uh, thoughts out there and been so thinking your last thoughts, I think, are very both challenging and stimulating there. Um, my question is, and I'm not sure who this is to, but has government thought about what the impacts of um, like homeless people who a uh, majority of them probably have a mental health issue and if those people were to take these psychedelics and to get the help they need, what the social implications of that could be? <laughs> I don't really have any specific thoughts on homeless people in general. Uh, sorry, specifically, but I guess in, in general. <clears throat> I, I think the question you're asking is sort of the, the theme I was trying to riff on a bit in, in what I was just saying there, and that these substances have massive potential, that they, they can help people, but for a lot of people, it's probably going to need ongoing support. It's not going to be just the psychedelic experience and the family cure. Probably there's going to need to be a lot of integration and a lot of continuing support. And so that's where it doesn't quite fit with the standard medical model, even though these substances are kind of being pursued within medicine. I don't know, Josh, do you have some thoughts on that? I've just got one more thought to follow that up. So I think that's one of the economic arguments which is being pushed to governments, is not just with homeless people, but if you can reduce the burden of disease. Um, and I think this is one of the big arguments which was pushed through to the American government with their large population of vets who have PTSD. If you can implement these um, therapies and they are effective, well, you're just going to reduce your cost of hospitalizations and homeless vet vets and stuff like that. But I don't know of any specific research on homeless populations done at the moment. But I think that is one of the broader arguments which has been used. Thanks. And uh, we have another question. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think my question is for Vince. Uh, definitely. Uh, um, thank you for such an excellent uh, speech. Um, my question was around, I think you made mention about how to manage or control those spiritual religious episodes. And I think you made a statement that that's not going to happen. And I'm just wondering how uh, is the institution going to manage that? Because those are subjective experiences, so I don't think denying people of those or ruling that out as not existing there, it's going to be a good thing. On the other hand, what is the plans? What is the training? I know there's a field called psychology of religion to kind of integrate that as part of the psychotherapy process so that what is the therapist can actually have some kind of uh, capacity to deal with those kind of issues. Yeah, great question. Thank you for asking that. I'd like to um, yeah, just try and clarify some of those ideas. So when I say that the sort of mainstream medicalization of psychedelics uh, isn't going to have a spiritual component. But what I really mean to say there is that it's not going to have a set of predefined beliefs in a specific cosmology. But as you say, people are definitely still going to have their own internal experiences. And um, people in psychedelic research pay a lot of attention to the concept of mystical experiences. And 
In fact, the degree to which someone has an experience that they describe as, as mystical is the, the best predictor of positive clinical outcomes. So we're all about encouraging those kinds of experiences, and that seems to be an absolutely critical part of the therapeutic process. What I wanted to say, though, is that it's not like, for example, if you were in Brazil and you go to an ayahuasca church and you have this intense cosmology that's a, a mix of Christian themes and, you know, a African kind of shamanic themes. In, in the, the <clears throat> Western kind of approach, the therapists are going to have to be very careful about not telling the people what they should, how they should interpret the experience and setting people up so that they can have these experiences that are quite possibly unlike anything that's ever happened to them before but make sense of it in a way that they're going to be able to still stay grounded within their lives. So it's not at all about denying the kind of mystical or um, you know, profound elements, but it's about providing a container in which someone can have that experience without it um, you know, completely rocking their world to the, to the point that it ends up causing harm rather than, than um, positive impacts. Um, so my question is about um the difference, I guess, between medicinal use and recreational use um, of uh, psilocybin and, and LSD. So, you know, you're very focused on the therapeutic benefits um, for people who have, you know, pre-existing mental health issues, but, you know, these exist on a spectrum. There are lots of people who maybe wouldn't qualify for, you know, medicinal use, but would benefit from the mystical sense, the spiritual sense, or the expanded sort of consciousness. Do you have any views on, you know, use of psilocybin and LSDs outside the therapeutic context? So because of, you know, the world we live in and the regulation and the laws that exist, we cannot encourage illegal activity. And there are harms associated with psychedelics. And at the moment, the biggest one probably is prosecution, unless you have those... Um, psychosis dependent pre-existing mental conditions. Uh, the, pay, the way people use psilocybin from magic mushrooms recreationally is about five to 10 milligrams, is that right? About, and then in psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, it's 25 milligrams. <coughs> so it's like s s insanely high that people wouldn't use at a recreational dose. And for a lot of people, it's quite unpleasant. Um, it's meant to like shock your system into repair. Um, but the trend you see, this, what happened with cannabis was it starts off with the most extreme cases, terminal patients, cancer patients, PTSD, you know, conditions that don't have other treatments, and then it slowly works its way down to more common conditions and then eventually is, you know, recreationally legalised. It is likely that the same thing might happen with psychedelics. In saying that, um, we don't have much data on how people are using psychedelics in uh, the community, but one thing that I've hung on to and seen is there's a global drug survey that looks at drug use all around the world, um, and psychedelics are pretty safe. So only 1% of uh, people using psychedelics that responded to this survey ended up in hospital when they were using psychedelics recreationally, and that was for like panic um, symptoms and uh, like not physiological symptoms, but psych psychotic symptoms. Um, if people were using psychedelics to self-medicate, that jumped up 400% to 4% of people ending up in hospital. So I guess psychedelics are very susceptible to set and setting, as in like your environment and your mindset and why you're going in there. And if people are hearing in the news that they can take psychedelics once or twice and be cured and then try and treat themselves, they can end up in trouble. And I have heard of a few horror stories of people going to underground treatment centres and ending up you know, permanently in a horrible state. You know, they end up in a um, side ward and they don't return. So it is a high risk, high reward is kind of how I think of it. Or I think of it as um, if you're going mountaineering, like it can be amazing, but you wouldn't do it without training or equipment. So I don't have to add to that. I would like to emphasize the issue of setting and the relationship of the people around you when you have it. It makes a radical difference whether you're among strangers or whether you're am among friends. Um, <clears throat> I spoke to the professor in Adelaide who is in charge of post-traumatic stress disorder doc uh, soldiers. 
and mm -hmm. asked him had he used any of these drugs and he said, one, we haven't any training and two, the government hasn't approved and so although I know that there are significant effects, we can't use it. So they've got this range of soldiers who are killing themselves who could be saved if they only took the risk and got some training and used one of these drugs. There's no doubt it works. Um, I've just got a thought, I'm sure that feedback's coming from, but I'm sorry, mm -hmm. okay. I've just got a thought um, regarding this, as I said towards the end of um, my little spiel, was that it's really important in the medical context to be doing this in a multidisciplinary team because uh, there's a danger of just over-medicalising these substances. Um, and they do have profound spiritual, cultural and social effects, um, which you know, we can't comment on objectively. Um, but this is where we do need interdisciplinary research from artists, from musicians, uh, from the whole, the whole range of allied health, um, which shouldn't just focus on, focus on specifically these extreme conditions, but that's how it will start off first. Can I just add, I mean, I, I loved your question because it goes to some of the very great anxieties caused by the drug in the late 60s and early 70s. You know, it was almost a textbook anti-youth action. I mean, and the settings in which I have encountered, and I'm an aged man now, but as it, when I have encountered psychedelics, has most was mostly in the context of youth, in the context of uh, being young people in a particular context, or um, and I, I, I just like to probe a little more. I mean, we license that the opioid crisis has been a dramatic um, sort of example of how harm done to people doesn't seem to have ever stopped um, the both you know the over prescribing a certain class of drugs. Alcohol is a pervasive and continuing uh, killer. But it is not just licensed, it is encouraged. Every bus stop has a, but the, 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 the psychedelics have this weird association seems still to, you know, almost like the idea that change might be brought about by them almost seems to be the scary part of them rather than the perpetuation of habits or the continuation of your, you know, long association with the bottle. Um, I don't know whether you want to comment on why there's a particular um, you know, is there any legacy of the 70s moral panic about why we're not moving further forward with a more generalised acceptance of, of psychedelics? Yeah, I'll say a couple of things. I, mean, I think there's definitely a hangover of moral panic around psychedelics, for sure. Um, we let people do all sorts of dangerous things in society, and objectively, psychedelics are not as dangerous as many of the things that people are allowed to do. Um, you know, I mean, uh, I, I can't really think of it. I feel like there's a really big difference between the thing, talking about psychedelics in the context of medicalization and psychedelics for self experimentation. So, I'm a scientist, so I really um, see the potential of psychedelics uh, as medicines, and my work is all based around that. And I think that we have a really strong responsibility when we're presenting something as a medicine to make it absolutely as safe as we can and to have all those kind of safety barriers there and um, you, you know I just think that's that's really critical and things need to go slow and it needs to be done well. I think it's a really different situation if someone wants to experiment on their own, you know, as, as uh, not speaking as a scientist but just as, as my sort of personal view, I, I feel like it's, it's just like an absolutely critical part of our human dignity that we're able to have um, uh, cognitive liberation. We're able to experiment with our consciousness and our minds in the way that we want to, but there absolutely are risks to that. And if someone does that on their own, then they, they need to be aware of those risks and, and not take them lightly, kind of, as Delara said, kind of to, to have the right equipment preparation in a certain setting if, if someone is going to do those things. And people have, have always done that. I mean, people didn't stop using psychedelics in the 70s when they became illegal. There's, a really rich underground history of uh, people doing those sorts of things and so you know if someone wants to do that I, I feel like that's in some ways their own business but it becomes very complicated at the moment when there is 
all of this positive media and all of these stories about how wonderful psychedelics are, and I think it's, it's, there is this danger of that leading people to, to sort of feel pressured or that this is the answer to something when it, it might not work out well for them. So, yeah, it's a complicated, complicated story. Sorry to interrupt the flow of questions there. I think people are scared by the marketing of it where you can do something and it will change you for the rest of your life. And people find that scary. But So most drugs will mimic something that happens in your brain anyway. Um, and then psychedelics are a tool. But the, you can have psychedelic experiences without psychedelics. They can be good or bad. Like a near-death experience can cause people to change their life. Going on an overseas trip will change your life. Like you will do that experience and you will never be the same again. Psychedelics are kind of a shortcut to those processes that we can experience in our normal life. I just thought, um, would it be interesting to talk about relative harm? So, I mean, we can talk about anecdotal data of people having psychotic events or having, having those issues, but, you know, um, psilocybin specifically has been around since, you know, the 50s. Um, we've got quite a lot of data around the good it can do and the harm it can do. And doesn't that then lead into, you know, following on from this, uh, doesn't it lead into a realm of decriminalization? You know, if one in eight um, Australians are taking SSRIs and uh, there's depressive rates through the roof, suicide rates as well, isn't it? Um, Interesting is kind of like a medical ethic um, angle of instead of going through all of these loopholes of getting psychiatrists to sign up off and set up correct procedures, if you look at relative harm of these chemicals, especially with alcohol, liver process, crashing cars, it's huge in comparison to the risk. So it's the, the, the more ethical means to go after decriminalization then for licensing these processes. Yeah. I understand what you're saying. The logic seems solid, but I think the important things to keep in mind are that we don't actually know that much about the harms in the general population. We know about the effects of psilocybin in very controlled trials where people with any sort of comorbidity have been screened out. And so if we, you know, I guess rush something like psilocybin to become a treatment, certainly people will find relief and they will be helped for sure. But people will also be harmed. You know, there's been some recent criticism of um, uh, clinical trials and psychedelics. Um, one of the things that participants in some of these trials have said is that the trial kind of ended and they felt like they were just kind of left in the middle of open heart surgery, that they, they didn't know what to do they didn't know what to do with the experience they had. And so it's, I was saying before about how it's not just this um, treatment with the psychedelic, but it's having the infrastructure to support people afterwards. And that's what I feel like gets missed out when people make the argument of like, well, we just know it works, so let's give it to everyone now. Like, I, think, I think it's more complicated than that. And that there's more of a duty of care that we have for patients than just saying, this works for a bunch of people, we reckon it's gonna work for you, go for it. Um, I'd just like to add something to that. I'm sure most of you will have heard the first principle of medical ethics do no harm. So, while we might talk about a relative harm, say compared to opioids or things which are known to cause massive disaster, alcohol, smoking, they're really there. We're not doing the active harm of saying the government or the scientific body endorses this. So, that comes in right at number one do no harm, take slow approach. It is pushed back against the ethics is practical, it's practical morals. It is pushed back against beneficence. So saving people who could be safe, people who will be suicidal from the guest or something like that. So there is a balance to it, which is why it actually has moved surprisingly quickly. I'm not sure if ten years ago if you, if you had a discussion like this at a university, you would have been pretty shocked to hear that the FDA has announced as a as MDMA or psilocybin is a breakthrough therapy. I was shocked two years ago when I heard that. Um, and I'll jump right into the field because I think there's huge gains to be had. But it still needs to be done in a controlled manner. Otherwise, we're going to get the same moral pushback um, we had in the 60s. We're going to have horror stories like the 
the litter mine where you have people who have a terrible reaction we didn't know about because that happened in one in 50,000. Um, and then we have all other medical drugs which go through these processes, they're screened out for that. So that's kind of a pushback against the ability part. Although I think there's a very strong argument for pushing through with decriminalization, which is what is happening overseas. And then you can gather more, I guess, uh, naturalistic data where people have taken some of these risks on themselves. But in the medical setting, we can't do that. Thank you. Then we'll move to the end. I've got a question. Maybe it's just stick it to the audience. I've got a question to follow on from that. That uh, you mentioned in order to develop a robust evidence base, that there needs to be protocols that are uh, that are standardised. What do they actually look like? Like what what would be a trial of you know psilocybin or LSD? Like I, I couldn't imagine that happening at you know the adult mental health outpatient. You know, unit. What, what do they look like? How are they standardised so you can compare um, evidence from different centres? <laughs> yes. um, the standard sort of protocol is typically maybe two or three preparation sessions, and all of the um, therapy sessions in clinical trial, not all, but most of the therapy sessions in clinical trial have uh, therapist dyads, so there's a male and female therapist, and they'll have maybe three um, preparation sessions. Usually, in most of the clinical trials, there's two dosing sessions, again, with, with two therapists, and they're whole day events. They're usually separated by two weeks, something like that. During the therapy session, there's some leeway as to um, the exact techniques that, that uh, therapists can use. Um, common sort of therapy frameworks uh, act. Um, there's also a push now slightly to, to introduce more like CDT kind of therapy. Um, but largely the therapists, it, it varies depending on the trial, but, but largely the therapists are there in a sort of supporting role to help the person process what's happening as it arises. It's not terribly directive during the, the dosing days. And then in most of the clinical trials, there's something like three integration sessions afterwards to help people um, to reflect on what's happened, debrief, make decisions about how that's going to affect their lives. And for many people, that seems to work brilliantly and there's great results. And that's why everyone is excited about psychedelics. But there's also some concern that that's not enough, especially follow-up therapy for everyone. There's also, just one final thing quickly, there's also not terribly great evidence yet about how long these benefits last. There's been some follow-up studies showing pretty good um, uh, uh, results at, at six months and 12 months, but it does also seem like some people may need yearly top-ups or six-monthly top-ups, and we just don't know yet how that should work, the best way to do that, who needs that, who doesn't, is that critical? Can you know make people follow up in smaller doses rather than large doses again? There's just lots we don't know about how to really keep people safe through that whole process. Thanks. You know, I'm really sorry to do this, but um, uh, we are moving because this is a packed evening. Um, and we have a 7:15 finish time because we want to give everyone a drink and allow you to come back in for the celebratory part of uh, celebrating the wonderful exhibition and the book that goes with it, which will. Uh, start from 7.30, but I want us to leave without thanking all our participants, and I want especially to thank uh, Bob, if I may, because in a way, what this panel has shown again and again in what you've said is the vital importance not only of thinking about these new substances, but also the vital importance of psychiatry, in particular psychotherapy, and the importance of still believing that we are able to aid, assist, and that therapy matters, and that the, and I think Bob is a shining example of someone who has always believed that, and uh, you know, despite all the obstacles, was able both to talk very uh, personally about personal but also has helped many people. So I want to thank Bob especially for making a, a return. <laughs> to, 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 to,